Welcome to County Road 189, the haunted stretch of road that runs right through the middle of Bearheart Nation. I'm your host and co-pilot, Josh Bearheart Hawk, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about death, ghosts, and supernatural elements in horror and real life. So, buckle in, keep your eyes on the road, and watch out for ghostly hitchhikers. All right, so as we're getting started here, before we really get into the meat of everything, <laughs> I wanted to talk briefly the reason why I started off with death as one of the things at the beginning of this episode and kind of with the stories that we're going to be talking about today is the month of July has been nuts for me. Um, I'm, I'm currently recording this podcast at the end of July. Uh, it's July 26th, so that'll give you some reference for how long in advance I sometimes record these. It's not that far in advance this time, but <laughs> I try to be as far as I can. However, that doesn't always work out. And as it turns out, in the month of July, it didn't work out for me. So early earlier on in July, the first week, I decided I was going to take the week off. I figured no podcast, no, no stories. I'm just going to take the week off, relax, go spend time with family, watch fireworks, all that kind of stuff. And so we did that on the 4th of July. Well, then on the 5th of July... I started, I noticed something on the back of my leg. It was behind the knee and it was just a little bump and it it looked like a bug bite of some kind, but I, I, I really didn't think much of it. Well, then going into Thursday, it started to kind of look, it was kind of getting bubbly and it looked almost like, almost like a burn, but it wasn't really a burn. And then I went and got some, I had to do some, some pictures and stuff like that that evening. And by that night, my legs started really breaking out getting bad and then into friday and saturday it kept getting worse and my wife was like well we need to go to the hospital i'm worried about it and i said no it's not a big deal it's, it's a spider bite by that point i had i had deducted or deduced <laughs> it was a brown recluse spider bite and honestly there's nothing that they can really do for even a brown recluse bite the the venom itself will it, it gets pretty gnarly pretty bad but unless there's an infection, like all they're going to do really is tell me if I went to the hospital, like tell me just to, you know, keep an eye on it. Right. Well, by Saturday, I had a, a fever Saturday morning. So I finally gave in. I said, OK, we'll go to the hospital. So we went up to the hospital and they told me, well, it looks like it's gotten infected. We're going to give you some antibiotics and then we want you to just kind of keep an eye on it over the next couple of days. And then come back if it gets worse. So they give me the antibiotics. Go home. I'm taking the antibiotics. I'm doing my thing. That Monday, it was it was still kind of getting worse. But it, it wasn't bad. It wasn't worrisome, I guess I should say. So I went out geocaching that day. <laughs> we went on a big streak. We did a bunch of geocaches. Having a good time. And the problem was it was, it was getting really... I don't want to get too descriptive on it because it was it was nasty, but I'll just say it was leaking stuff that it shouldn't have been leaking. <laughs> I was things were bursting. It was it was really really bad, and I wrapped it up for the day and was like, okay, I'm just gonna push through this. It's not that big a deal. And then Tuesday comes around, and now it's it's yellow fluid coming out of it, which from everything I could tell is a sign of a really bad infection. So I was like, okay, we're gonna go back up. We're going to, there's got to be something else I could do for me here. So we go up to the hospital on Tuesday evening and we were there for a good four or five hours before they finally said, okay, we're going to admit you for, <laughs> they, they didn't really know how long. They basically just said until it starts to look better. We're, and basically what they did was they admitted me to the hospital Tuesday night. They put me on antibiotics. There's two different antibiotics. It was the strongest stuff that they had available. And basically every, I think, it, I think it was every 12 hours, although I didn't really keep track, <laughs> but, but they were, they were pumping me full of these antibiotics, uh, throughout the day and night. And it finally started to kind of look better and it was starting to heal up a little bit. So uh, by Friday afternoon, they were finally like, okay, you can go home. We're going to give you another course of antibiotics to take it home. And you finish those off and keep an eye on it. Go back. To, you know, I had a follow-up appointment with the wound clinic and all that kind of stuff to make sure it was healing properly. So I went 
home that Friday, started taking the antibiotics they put me on, and everything seemed fine. <laughs> and as of right now, that was last week. Uh, but midway through the week, I started breaking out in this rash all over my body. And I was like, what is going on now? Turns out the antibiotic that they prescribed me was an antibiotic called Bactrim. And one of the side effects that you can have with it as an allergic reaction is actually this, this rash in this it was a, it was a full on allergic reaction. It hadn't gotten so far, thankfully, as to like close up my airways or anything. But had I kept taking it, it would have. <laughs> so that was attempt number two that July had of trying to kill me, and I'm I'm done with it now. Okay, July is almost over. I'm completely done with July. It has gotten to the point now where I'm just like, I just want to finish the month. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to be alive at this point. But the side effect of all of that was I fell behind on everything I was doing. So I've been working on a startup company that I'm, I'm running with my buddy. And we've been trying to get that off the ground. So I've been working on that. And it's been taking up a lot of my time. And I've been, and then of course, writing stories for YouTube and doing this podcast and all this kind of stuff is all stuff I just couldn't do for three weeks straight. And it's been killing me. <laughs> I've been wanting to get out and do this stuff. It's been driving me absolutely nuts. So <laughs> I, I was sitting here, uh, basically, as we got into this week, the first thing I did, I wrote a new ho short horror story. And that's that, that story, by the time this comes out, that story will have come out this past Friday. Uh, it's called the uh, it's called Thanatos Pharmaceuticals. And I'm not going to play that in this podcast, but in a future episode, I will play it because I want to talk about it. It's a two-part thing. So I'll probably play both parts at once in the future, in, probably in the next episode. I'm not really sure yet. But so that, I, I wrote that because I had been thinking about that while I was in the hospital, actually. <laughs> it was one that I had kind of been batting around. And then I got out the new episode of GPS Signal Lost. And... I've got a cool direction for that story. It's been getting crazy. It's, it's episode seven, episode eight. I've already got written. I have stuff to record it and put it out. So I'm I'm excited to finally be getting all of this stuff done. And then I also went out and filmed a cemetery chat on Monday, which wasn't really a cemetery chat. <laughs> it was um, sitting in the cemetery and talking about what happened in July, basically for my viewers on YouTube and for those of you who don't know, if you're listening to this on a podcast platform somewhere, I have a YouTube channel. These podcasts go on there as well as a bunch of other stuff. And I do these things I call cemetery chats. And the idea behind them goes back to the 1800s when cemeteries used to be a place that people would actually go hang out. They would have picnics. They would go gather around relatives' graves for holidays and that kind of stuff as a way to remember the relative and that kind of thing. They weren't spooky, scary places that they become nowadays. So <laughs> I wanted to kind of bring some of that back. So I do these cemetery chats, and that was kind of what I did on Monday because I, I spent so much time in the cemeteries facing my own mortality as well as remembering the people that are buried there. And so I wanted to be able to kind of express what had happened and share that on YouTube in a way that my normal viewers would be able to, you know, kind of appreciate people have been around for a while, you know? So I did that on Monday, Tuesday night. I did a test, uh, test live stream on YouTube actually, because I've got some ideas that I want to do for more content. <laughs> there's, there's so much stuff that I'm, I essentially what happened to me in the past month is I have got a new lease on life because the hospital, the doctors, uh, nurses, even the, the lady at the wound care clinic when I was talking to her this past week when I went to, you know, follow up visit was like, yeah, you're it's good that you came in because had you not come in when you did and had you waited a couple more days, it's very likely that this would have been a, you would have you would have died. And for me, that's like, oh, my God, there's so much stuff that I want to do. There's so much stuff that I haven't done and I need to get this stuff out there. I need to really focus on this stuff. So I've got this new lease on wanting to get all this stuff done. So I've got an idea for a live stream. So I wanted to test that out. So I did that on Tuesday night this past week. And that was a, it wound up being 45 minutes. I meant to do 20, 
I wanted to do a 20 minute test stream and just be like, okay, I'm going to see how this works. Make sure everything's functioning properly. People showed up. We started talking. It wound up being 45 minutes. <laughs> so we had all that. Um, and then, like I said, as I'm recording this, it's the 26th, it's Wednesday, and I am <laughs> sitting here at 1045 at night recording a podcast when I should be sleeping. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I have not been sleeping this week very much because I just feel like I want to get so much done. And I've really been driving on, especially my YouTube stuff and, 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 and stories and stuff this week because that's something that's super important to me. And my schedule right now and it's fixing to go into August is, is really crazy. You know, I've got all the stuff I'm doing for YouTube, the writing, all that kind of stuff. I'm actually working on a collaboration project, hopefully with uh, some other authors. I've got, I've got some feelers out there. I don't know what's going to come of that yet. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I've got that going on. So all of that with my own personal stuff, as well as then working on the side business, it's not really a side business. It's a full, it's a full business. I keep calling it a side business. I'm the chief operating officer of this company. So I am working on that and trying to build this company from the ground up. So that's a whole nother thing. And this is something I'm learning as I go, basically first, a lot of the stuff. And I'm getting ready to start a new term for school because I'm in school for um, business degree in marketing. So I'm trying to accomplish that. And I finished the first term. The first term ends on July 31st. The next one starts on August 1st. So I'm getting ready to start the new term and just have all of that going on. So I am busy. There's a lot going on, but I'm loving it right now. I'm excited because there's so much going on. And I just, I want to dive into all of it all at once. <laughs> so that leads me kind of getting into, and then that's why I wanted to bring up the death thing, because a lot of stories, stories that I write, stories that other people write, they deal with death ghosts, the supernatural elements, that kind of stuff. The whole life after death thing is a huge deal in horror. And the, a big reason for that, it goes back kind of to, I don't want to say religion per se, because I don't think religion is where life after death really uh, became a thing. I think people, we don't like to think of the idea that when it's all over here, it's all over. You know, we like to imagine and think of, you know, when we die, there's more to it. And that's why even people who aren't religious, um, when I, uh, over the past 10 or 15 years or so, I have changed a lot of my personally held views on religion and ghosts and that kind of stuff. And for the first part of that, I kind of fell away from my religion first. And I found it easier to stop believing in a deity, at least a personal deity at first, and then a deity in general then it was to stop believing in things like ghosts because I still wanted to believe, you know, that there's a life after death. And so I was trying to find ways that ghosts could be real and ways that those could be things that we could, you know, find and, and do scientific experiments on and that kind of stuff. And that was one of the last things that I kind of started to move away from. I still hope, you know, there's a there's a part of me that's like, man, it would be really cool if when we died, we were able to maybe explore the universe or get out or, you know, maybe there's another element to this life. But honestly, I can't bring myself to fully believe that or fully buy into that uh, anymore. I used to I used to very much, but anymore, it's like there's no evidence for it. And it really bothers me in a, in a lot of ways. And that's why I really love to add those elements into my stories because it's a way that I can hold on to that even if I don't believe it per se. And a big part of that's because, you know, you don't choose your beliefs. You don't pick and choose. You can't say, well, I believe this thing now. You know, you believe what you believe. So for me, losing that belief in an afterlife, uh, this is a way for me to hold on to it. It's using stories where there's a potential for other things, where there's a supernatural element to the world, and because it makes it more exciting. Because let's face it, the world that we live in, the reality that we live in, it's kind of fun. But on the other hand, it's kind of boring if there's nothing supernatural out there, right? I, I can't imagine I'm the only one that thinks that. Like, <laughs> it's, it's boring when there's no ghosts or curses or just supernatural elements in general. It's, it's boring without that kind of stuff. 
And I think that in my ideal world, that would all exist and that would all be stuff that like we could have. It would be like the TV show Supernatural, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. <laughs> it would follow a similar similar thing to that minus the dying at the end of every season. <laughs> if you've seen that show, you know what I'm talking about. But so that is is where I'm at in my mindset right now and where I'm sitting as I'm recording this and as I'm thinking about these stories I wanted to add in for this episode because you know like I stated at the when I first started doing this podcast I want to include two or three stories of my own in each episode because that's where it's fun you know I get to share my stories share my work in a different way because obviously they're already on YouTube but this podcast goes on YouTube as well as out to every other podcast platform so no matter what platform you're listening to it on, I want to be able to share these stories with people in whatever way matches where they're, where they're at. Whew. Okay. <laughs> so that was a lot to get started out. Um, so now let's kind of roll into the stories a little bit. So what I want to start with is the, speaking of supernatural and stuff like that, Believability of supernatural elements in a story is a big thing for the enjoyment, I think, of most listeners, watchers, readers, whatever whatever medium it happens to be in. And what I mean by believability is the consistency within the story world with the elements. So if you establish there's some supernatural elements in your fictional world, that's perfectly fine. But you need to be able to keep a consistency with the rules of those supernatural elements. So, you know, if somebody dies and comes back as a ghost, there has to be some consistency in how that works. And it's not always accomplished. It's not always easy to accomplish. And I think a lot of writers don't necessarily, maybe they're trying to run with the story, but they don't really think about the rules. They don't go back and they don't edit it to, to, to realize that, oh, I set this up as a thing and now I'm not even honoring that anymore. Uh, so <laughs> it's something that if you're going to write a story, a supernatural story, you need to have some consistency within your world. It doesn't have to be believable in our world, you know, because it's a fictional universe. You're creating your own little space, but the rules need to be consistent within the story. So with that out of the way, as we, as we roll into the first story here, <laughs> these are going to be stories that I actually released in June. The last one, I think came out uh, the last Friday in June, I believe, because I was my, my end, my goal for the end of the month for every month was supposed to be to have some kind of story based in a, a legend, but I didn't accomplish that in June because I didn't have a legend that really fit that I really wanted to use. So that kind of went out the window, but I had another story in its place. Uh, but what we're going to start with here is this first story is called what possessed him. And the story itself is, is an abandoned building story. And I got the idea from, realistically, it was the Lima Tuberculosis Hospital in Lima, Ohio. I'd never been there. I've heard about it. I think it's been torn down. I don't even think it still exists uh, because people were going in and they were breaking into it and that kind of thing because they saying it's haunted, that kind of stuff, uh, which is the sad truth of a lot of abandoned buildings is they fall into disrepair. If the owners aren't active, if they don't have security, People are breaking in all the time. There's graffiti all over the place. It just they it's it gets run down, and you lose a piece of history in in all of that. And so that kind of upsets me when I see that kind of stuff. But what I wanted to do with this was kind of honor that idea of these abandoned buildings, specifically the Lyme Tuberculosis Hospital and others, because tuberculosis hospitals were all over the place. <laughs> but I wanted to honor the idea of those with a story, kind of talking about an abandoned building in a way of maybe one that got revived, you know, because there's buildings, uh, asylums and, and, and TB hospitals all over in different places in the country that have been bought by private entities that have preserved them or are preserving them. And a lot of them use ghost hunting and those kind of things as a way to prop up their, their efforts to restore the building or to keep the building in a, in a working or in, in a good enough state that people can still visit it, you know, so we can preserve the history. Uh, there's a there's some here locally that I know of that the Mansfield Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio, is one. There's also one in Fairfield County, 
in Lancaster that was an old infirmary that private entities bought up and are using ghost hunting tours as a way to fund rehab efforts for the buildings. And I think that's really cool. So I wanted to incorporate that in the story as well. So, as has become normal, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll play the story. And then after the story, I'll talk a little bit about it, wrap it up, talk about what, what I thought, you know, what I was going for with the ending, that kind of stuff. And then we'll talk about the next story. So let's go ahead and get jump in here. So this is What Possessed Him. The old building sat on the outskirts of town, empty and alone. After hundreds of nights filled with teen explorers and ghost hunters damaging it, the owners finally installed a security system. Guards would patrol on the weekends, and the place became much harder to break into. In its heyday, it had been a hospital for those with tuberculosis and other diseases, known by the locals as the Old TB Hospital. The real name for it was the Franklin County Center for Respiratory Illness. The death count was unknown officially, but it was rumored to have been in the thousands over five decades of operation. Even with the increased security, there were attempts to break into the building almost monthly. After what happened one night in June of 2019, however, no one wanted to go near the building. The media coverage of the trial that followed one overnight excursion would rival some of the more well-known murder cases from history with those who followed it being split on the truth. Andrew and John had been friends since childhood. Their mutual love for all things spooky brought them together in elementary school and carried them all the way into adulthood. It was only natural that they would decide to form a paranormal research group in college, convincing a handful of mutual friends to join them. The first three years were good, but slow. Everyone in the team worked their normal jobs through the week, spending the weekends on investigations. They weren't famous enough for a TV show, but they would upload their exploits to the internet, edited together by their team tech guru, Charlotte. This series became popular over time, hitting a point where they were earning some money and finally making enough money to make it into a real business. Andrew was the financial brains of the group with John being the one to find and schedule investigations. Some individuals and even companies paid the group to figure out if the building that they lived or worked in was haunted. Outside of these paying gigs, they would usually get free entry into otherwise locked locations. Late one Friday evening, John received an email from the owner of the old TB hospital looking for a well-known team to come out and debunk the idea that their building was haunted. He spent a couple of hours researching the building, ultimately deciding to run the idea by the team on Monday. After discussing it in their morning stand-up meeting, John replied to the email and let the owners know that the team would be happy to come out and investigate, but he cautioned that they did not focus on debunking or proving things only gathering evidence to be evaluated later. Several emails and a phone call later, and the team was on their way to the Franklin County Center for Respiratory Illness. They were a couple of members short, but they had more than enough equipment to make up for that. Arriving at the old hospital around 2 in the afternoon, they met with the owner and spent a couple of hours walking through the facility and learning its history. Once they were comfortable with the layout, they started planning where to place the cameras, motion sensors, temperature sensors, and other gear that would help them monitor the property as well as the team. After filming what would be the intro to their video and getting a few photos for the teaser, they grabbed a quick sandwich from the cooler and started their investigation. The atrium acted as their base of operations, being central to the floor plan of the building. They had monitors for everything, and Charlotte would be spending the evening watching the cameras and meters as Andrew and John moved from room to room with some of the smaller equipment to try to capture EVPs, EMF readings, and other real-time interaction. The rest of the crew would be standing by to assist with filming or whatever else needed done. Starting in one of the patient rooms, 
Andrew set a voice recorder down on a table and started asking questions. Is anyone here? He said, looking around for any sign of movement. Can you tell us your name? John piped in. They sat in the quiet of the dark room for several minutes before John suggested they try with the voice box. It was more real time than the recorder, though they didn't have much success with it normally. Turning on the device, John started asking questions. Who is in the room with us? Silence. Is there anyone here? Still nothing. After a few more minutes of no activity, they decided to move on. Grabbing the gear, they were about to move to an office down the hall when the two-way radio went off. Guys, I just saw some movement in the third floor, camera 303, Charlotte said. Wasn't that the spot the owner said they found a body a few years ago? John asked. Yeah, by the nurse's station. Maybe we'll have more luck up there, Andrew replied, heading for the doorway. Climbing the stairs, the pair moved slow and deliberate, listening for any possible noise as they passed each floor. The building had been extremely quiet since they arrived, which wasn't overly surprising. The oddest part of the whole investigation had been the owner's insistence that the place wasn't haunted. Most of the people they worked with seemed to want a ghost or two to be found, but this one was almost begging them not to find anything. Reaching the third floor, they moved into the hallway and looked toward the area Charlotte had reported seeing movement. Hey, did you happen to see what moved up here? John asked over the radio. It looked like something fell off the counter, but I couldn't be completely sure. Charlotte replied. Moving closer to the nurse's station, the two men crept around and looked for anything that looked out of the ordinary. Seeing nothing that stood out, Andrew turned the voice recorder back on and set it on the counter while John readied the EMF reader and the voice box. Once everything was in place, John spoke up. Is there anyone here with us? It seemed for a brief moment that this would be no different than the lower floor. Then a voice came through the voice box. Leave, it said. Andrew and John both jumped back looking at each other with wide eyes and gaping mouths. That's the clearest I've ever heard that damn thing, Andrew said. We might actually be onto something here. Uh, what's your name? Why do you want us to leave? John said, moving the EMF reader around the room. Sick here, the voice responded. Yes, you probably were very sick, but not anymore, John said. That's real nice, man. Make fun of them for being dead. I'm not making fun of them. It's a fact, and they probably aren't sick anymore. I don't know what you guys are doing up there, but the temp just dropped like five degrees, and the camera went fuzzy for a sec. Charlotte radioed. We're getting some responses up here. I'm going to try to set up the pod, John replied. Reaching into his bag, John pulled out a little device that looked like a large soup can. It had some small LED lights on the top of it and a small knob protruding from the spot in the middle of the lights. Setting it down on the floor, he flipped a switch to turn it on. The LED lights flashed bright, four red, four yellow, four blue, before shutting off. The knob flashed blue for a couple of seconds before switching to a projection of a green laser grid. Standing up, John observed the blue LEDs lighting up and smiled. As he moved further away from the device, the yellow LEDs took over for the blue lights and finally the red lights were the only ones shining until they too went out as he reached the edge of the radius. I love that thing, Andrew said with a smile. It's a shame we don't get to use it more often, but maybe this time we'll get some results. Pretty lights, the voice box went off again. Yes, they are pretty. Uh, why don't you get closer and check them out? John said, as his eyes met Andrew's. They weren't used to having so much happening so early. They usually had to sit around in silence for hours before getting this kind of interaction, and it was never really as clear as it was now. The owner of the building might not like it, but there was definitely something odd going on. 
As they watched, a shadow moved into the range of the green grid and the red LEDs lit up. The yellow LEDs flickered for a second, but whatever had entered the space seemed to vanish before it moved any further. Holy shit, dude! Did you see that? John said as a massive smile crossed his face. Andrew didn't respond. He just stared at the grid, his eyes wide. Andrew? Are you okay? Andrew turned away from John and started walking down the hallway, further into the hospital wing. John stood frozen for a couple of seconds before following his friend. He thought that maybe Andrew had heard something and he was trying to keep quiet to avoid scaring it away. They crept along in silence for nearly two minutes before Andrew stopped in his tracks next to an open door. John recognized it from their earlier tour as an elevator that supposedly malfunctioned at one point, leading to the death of two nurses who didn't realize the car hadn't arrived when the doors opened. Moving up next to his friend, John looked around before turning to face Andrew. Hey man, is, is everything alright? Did you hear something? He whispered. Andrew just stared back, a hollow look in his eye. His face appeared to be drooping slightly on one side, and John was just about to call for help on the radio when Andrew grabbed him and moved toward the elevator opening. I could have saved her if she hadn't been holding on so tight, Andrew said in someone else's voice. John spread his arms wide and held on to the sides of the opening as Andrew tried to force him into the shaft. He didn't have time to wonder what was happening to his friend as he struggled against the weight of the bigger man. Andrew, John, what the hell's going on? Charlotte's voice cracked through the radio. I see you at the opening to the elevator. Is everything okay? John wished he could reach his radio as he felt his arms growing weaker. Even as he pushed back with all his strength, he knew he didn't have much left in him. The sound of the footsteps in the stairwell told him that the rest of the crew was coming, but he didn't know if he could hold on. As the footsteps grew closer, he felt his shoulder pop and he lost his grip on the doorway. He fell into the shaft as one of the other guys grabbed onto Andrew and pulled him back. They yelled down, shining their lights into the void, but it was too late. Andrew started to panic, asking where he was and what was happening as the team held him down. They held him there until help arrived, restraining him as he yelled and cried. John's body was recovered from the bottom of the shaft, a look of horror frozen on his face. The motive for the murder was assumed to be money, but nothing solid could be proven. After the trial was over and the life sentence was handed down, people on both sides of the case still had the same question. What possessed him? Okay, so, <laughs> the end of that story, you're probably like, what just happened? So, the original idea for that story actually came from a uh, super short story that I wrote, a flash horror story, back in, like, April or May. <laughs> I, was, I was doing a flash horror story every day for a couple of months, and I wrote one about this guy who was in a police station. He'd been arrested for killing his friend, and he didn't really want to admit what happened because... He knew the police wouldn't believe it. And I expanded on that to create what possessed him, 
which is essentially the same idea uh, except from the beginning. So the guy gets possessed and winds up killing his friend. Now, one thing that I did with that story, if you noticed, and if you're listening on headphones, you probably noticed it. You might have been noticed. You might have noticed it if you're listening in a car, depending on how your speaker is set up. Uh, But I I did some different things with the audio, Uh, partially going back and forth to kind of see. I, I wanted it to sound good in headphones, and I wanted it to sound like it was coming from different sides of you, so you could kind of have that that surround sound feeling. So I did that. It was an audio experiment. <laughs> I, I liked how it came out. And I got some good feedback from people that listen through headphones. So I, I don't know how often I'll do that with stories. It really has to fit with the story because not every story works that way. I think what Possessed Him did because of the building and because of just the overall element of what was going on with the radios and that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I wanted that to be a thing. And then I also wanted to have the end line of what possessed him be a double meaning. Uh, for me, it's important when I'm getting into a story to have that, uh, to have more than one meaning for things when I can. And particularly with this one, because it fits with the title and the very last line, what possessed him. It's a question that you ask when somebody does something, you know, that commits a heinous crime. And you're like, what possessed them to do this? Why did they do this? And, but the double meaning, of course, being what kind of spirit possessed him? You know, he's whispering and talking about, you know, she just want to let go or whatever. So there was something actually possessing him. And I loved, when I got done with it, I was really proud of myself for how it came out. (laughs) I was, I was super happy. And that doesn't always happen with the end of the stories. So I was, I was excited to finally have that one. (laughs) Um, but moving on into the next, so the next story is actually called The Guardians. And this is another haunted location type of situation. Um, but I was kind of on the fence, and even now, I'm not 100% either way, uh, haunted or possessed location. And in this case, a church cemetery concept. So normally in stories with supernatural elements, you'll usually find a religious element. Um, and typically, especially in the United States, I don't know about the rest of the world. I don't watch a lot of movies outside of <laughs> outside of the U S as far as that's concerned, but like, uh, especially within the U S they'll have the, the very Christianity is a big, the biggest religion in the country. So there's a big Christian Christian element. So churches are typically more seen as like uh, safe spaces in, in horror and in supernatural type of things. You know, you go to the priest or the priest comes to the house, like, uh, <laughs> you know, comes to con or clear the, clear the spirits and that kind of stuff. And so you have this element, but you don't very often see situations where churches are seen as cursed spaces. And so what I wanted to do was kind of put one of those out there. And some of that's based off of a combination of different churches that I've seen while out geocaching because one of my favorite hobbies and pastimes is geocaching and my favorite geocaches to get are in cemeteries and a lot of cemeteries are attached to churches so i will go out and you know my wife and i and my son will go with us often and we'll go out to these cemeteries find those geocaches and we'll see some really cool different styles of churches especially in rural ohio you've got a ton of different uh, types the architecture is different in a bunch of them depending on what part of the state you're in and they're really cool to see, but then you also have these ones that are really, really old. We've got church buildings here that were built in the early part of the 20th century and some dating back to even the 19th century that are really old, run down, out in the middle of nowhere. They were built when the town, you know, a small town was formed. The church was the, the central place for everybody. And since then, everybody's moved on to other churches or whatever. So to see these creepy old buildings and imagine like, what if something was in there? What if, what if that was haunted or, or a possessed building of some kind, you know? So I wanted to kind of branch off of that. But then also when I, when I was a kid, uh, and I talked about this briefly in uh, prior episodes, my mom used to take us out ghost hunting. And I remember one night we were out, it was his mom and one of her friends, and then there were six of us kids there. 
<laughs> it was a full car, full van full of kids. And we were, we, I don't remember, I don't even remember where the place was at. It had to be somewhere up by like the Knox County area in Ohio, because that's most of the places that we hung out. But there was this church, I guess that was, I don't know if it was supposed to be haunted or supposed to be like satanic rituals were held there. I, I don't a hundred percent know because I was too young and then they didn't really explain it to me as we went out there. But we parked and we're sitting there in front of this church and it's this old, old building. And they have these windows in the basement. And you really couldn't see much. We had the headlights on. It was dark. But it looked like there were some red eyes in the coming through the window in the basement. And I'm sure now, looking back on it, it was probably like some lights for like a heater or something like that. Because it was there's two of them, but they went off after a while. So it was some kind of light inside for something. But uh, we stuck around for a couple of minutes and then got out of there. And so I wanted to kind of, I thought to myself, you know, what if there was some kind of uh, entity in a church that people didn't want to go around that would harm people? Or, or in this case, as you'll find out at the end, may not want to harm people. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that. Let's go ahead and get the story and then we'll talk a little bit about the ending. So this is The Guardians. There were plenty of rumors surrounding the old graveyard, but truth be told, more people were afraid of the church than the burial ground. Kids would sneak between the headstones late at night on a dare, but few ever attempted to enter the angry old building that towered over the necropolis. Stained glass windows depicting Jesus in various scenes line both sides of the church, as would be expected, but they aren't normal. There's just something off about the way his eyes look. The bell tower stands tall, visible for miles around, but the cross on top of the tower was torn off by a storm at some point, leaving only a jagged post. A gravel walkway in front of the main door encircles an old tree that used to be the centerpiece of a garden, long since wilted. The tree itself is long past its glory days, barely surviving each gust of wind that shakes its branches. Big wooden doors stand as the only barrier to entry. Legend says they were carved out of wood from the Tree of Life itself and brought over on the first vessel to reach the Americas. Records show they were built using wood from an old cypress that acted as a hanging tree until the mid-19th century. Sitting on either side of the door, ever vigilant in their post, is a pair of stone guard dogs. They were carved from the whitest stone Mother Nature could produce, though time has taken a toll on their pristine exteriors. Coal black eyes stand out, as dark in the present as the day they were set in place. Some folks claim they've seen the eyes glowing on certain nights, but most believe that's just the trick of the light. Twenty years ago, a teen from the local area wanted to show off his bravery by being the first to enter the abandoned church. Everyone told him it was a bad idea. Several people tried to stop him, but he managed to sneak in when no one was looking. What happened on that dark night is anybody's guess, but they found his body lying in the cemetery the next morning with scratch and bite marks all over it. That was the last time anyone would venture into the building, until last week. Sean wasn't from the local area. He spent his days trying to prove the unseen, chasing ghosts and demons and sharing his exploits on a blog. Sitting at a diner on Main Street, he looks around at all the simple folk enjoying their meals. He's in town on business, but he always enjoys people watching when he gets the chance. It's always the same scene. A couple of older folks sipping their coffee and reminiscing about how much better things used to be. A group of kids in their late teens or early 20s hanging out in the corner while they make plans for the weekend. A mother smiling through the pain of waiting tables to make ends meet. 
He sometimes wishes things weren't so predictable at every stop. Aside from the people, the haunts all wind up being the same too. Sure, they all have a different origin story, but in the end, they all wind up the same way. A bump from the floor above, a weird sound on the recording device that might be a voice if you turn your head just the right way and blink enough. Lately, it just wasn't as fun as it had been in the beginning. He was 15 when he got into ghost hunting, pushed headfirst into it when he watched a boy that must have been 10 years younger than he was walk through a solid door in a hospital. Asking the nurse about the boy, he would discover that the child was very sick, but she was sure he would pull through. She didn't know it yet, but the boy had passed away just a few moments before. From that moment on, Sean dedicated himself to finding proof of the paranormal. The search hit home when his parents died in a plane crash just a few years later. He visited the site of the crash several times, but nothing ever showed up. Now, in his late 30s, he was starting to regret wasting his life. The few unexplainable encounters he had over the years weren't recorded and he didn't even trust his own senses anymore. He figured he would give it until the end of the year and then move on, find something else to waste time and money on. Paying his bill, he left the diner and moved back out into the cool afternoon air. Leaves were falling from trees all around him as their branches were blown around and he couldn't help but smile. He always loved the outdoors, especially at times like these. Maybe in his next life, he'd be a forest ranger. Climbing into his van, he spent a few minutes checking all the gear once more before heading to the location. He'd been to plenty of old graveyards, but he hadn't had the chance to check out a haunted church yet. Plugging in a couple of batteries he had missed on an earlier check, he climbed up in the driver's seat, started the van, and began making his way toward the location. He pulled up to the gate as the sun sat just over the horizon and got busy unloading. There wasn't a lot of gear to take in at first, but he had to have some lights and a couple of cameras as well as his voice recorder. Going through the gate and walking up to the front of the church, he was unnerved at the sight of two stone dogs staring at him. Creeping past them, he set down one of the lights and reached out for the door handle. A jolt of energy, presumably static electricity, shot through him as he touched the brass doorknob and turned. The creaking sound filled the room as the door opened and he stepped inside for the first time. The interior of the building was in much better shape than he assumed it would be based on the exterior and there was a soft glow coming from the altar. Moving further in, he could see the floor was polished and there wasn't even a hint of dust anywhere. Well, I'll be damned, he said, his eyebrows furrowing as his eyes explored the space. I hope not, but that's not for me to judge. Another voice broke the silence. Dropping his equipment, Sean stumbled backward, falling over a set of pews. Getting back to his feet, he looked at the front of the building to see a priest standing there with a smile on his face. My apologies. I didn't mean to startle you. We don't get many visitors here. I'm Father Thomas, the priest said. I should be the one apologizing. I didn't know this building was still in use. It was supposed to be abandoned, and from how it looks outside, it's all right, my son. Like I said, we don't really get many people out here these days. Is there anything I can help you with? I've heard rumors about this building being haunted. There was a boy who died here a few years back. I don't suppose you'd know anything about that. Sean started walking toward the priest as he looked around more. There's no hauntings around here that I'm aware of. And no one has died on the property either. I'm not sure who would be spreading such rumors. Sean was now standing only feet away from the priest and he could tell something was off. He looked like a normal priest, but something seemed wrong. 
His smile seemed to be much broader than it should have been, and his eyes were much darker than any Sean could remember seeing. As he tried to work out in his head what was going on, he realized that there were no crosses in the old church. It was a little detail that he never really paid any attention to, but churches usually had crosses in them, at least one over the altar, but usually in several other places as well. Well, it seems like I was mistaken about this place. I'll just grab my equipment and be going, Sean said as he went back to where he had dropped everything. Why don't you stick around? We have an amazing service planned this evening. It's been so long since we've had any parishioners. The priest was now standing at the back of the church, still smiling. Sean could feel his heart racing as he moved toward the door. He could buy new equipment, but he needed to get out of there. As he approached the door, he barely noticed the priest following him. Oh, you don't want to go out there. That's where they are, Father Thomas warned as he grabbed Sean's shoulder. Forcing the priest's hand away, Sean burst through the door into the cool night air. Sprinting to the van, he didn't hear the growls. It was only when he reached the driver's door that he realized he had dropped the keys in the church along with the gear. As he tried to decide what to do, he heard the sound of something running all around him, circling the van. He pulled again on the door, hoping it would open despite the lock. As he started pounding on the window, whatever had been running around him stopped. Taking the chance, he tore back across the yard toward the church, hoping to get back inside and away from whatever was out there. As he approached the doors, he noticed the statues were no longer there and the door was now shut. Climbing the stairs, he could hear barking from near the van as he pounded on the solid doors, begging to be let back inside. The barking became interspersed with howls as they started moving closer to the church once more. Giving up on the door, Sean moved back down the steps and ran as fast as he could into the graveyard. Before he could get more than a few steps into it, something hard ran into him and tackled him to the ground. The morning sun broke through the window of the sheriff's station, shining on a pot of freshly brewed coffee. As the deputy prepared for the day ahead, he heard the sound of his radio crackling. The sheriff's voice broke through, requesting backup and a medical examiner at the old graveyard south of town. Looks like one of the mountain lions had some fun last night. There's not much left of this one. Okay, so I wanted to leave the mystery at the end there <laughs> for who Father Thomas was. And that's why I said at the beginning, may or may not want to harm. So Father Thomas, you can tell, is, is trying to keep keep the guy from going out of the building because of these dogs. And it's kind of a question of who the guardians, what are they guarding? Why are they keeping people out of the church? What's Father Thomas's role in all of this? Is he evil? Is he good? What's going on? But I wanted to leave that open to interpretation for the for the reader or listener because for me, that's kind of the fun of it. That's what drives the conversation, and I want people to have the conversation. I want two or three different people to be able to listen to my stories and be able to have different opinions about what the end means and be able to validate all of those opinions. Because to me, that's where it's fun. And if I can create that kind of conversation and get people talking, that's that's more <laughs> that's more enjoyment that people are getting out of the story. It's not just you listen to a story or you read a story and then you're done with it. Well, now you can talk about it. Now you've got something to say afterwards and, and you can drive that conversation and keep that going. And that's where I try to go with most of my stories. And The Guardians is a perfect example with how the, how the end plays out. So the third story and the final story of our little trilogy here today is called the Florence Bridge. And this one is another one based off of <laughs> something I found during a geocaching adventure. Uh, so my wife and I went out. This was in, I think it was early June, if I remember correctly. And we were looking for different geocaches. I had a list of a few different ones. 
and I found this one that said it was uh, near guardrail. And th there's certain geocaches that people will put on guardrails off of the sides of like highways and back roads and that kind of stuff. And those are the ones you always have to be real careful of because traffic <laughs> cars will run you over. But we get out to this one and there's a big road close sign up. I'm like, okay. And up to the road close sign was like fresh pavement. Like they had just paved it not too long ago. So that's weird. <laughs> then so we, we park at the road close sign and we get out. It's the it's in the middle of nowhere, basically. I mean, there's fields all around us. There's no traffic, nobody coming around. And we start walking and there's grass coming through the cracks of the road. You can tell this road hasn't been touched in forever. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And this bridge off of the, is off in the distance as we're walking. We don't find the geocache, first of all. Um, actually, no, I think we did actually find the container, if I remember correctly. God, it's been so long ago. <laughs> we might have found it and it wasn't in great shape. But either way, I wanted to look at the bridge and I wanted to get some pictures. So I went back to the car, got my camera, walked back up. We got all the way to the bridge to find that this bridge is shut down completely. And it's got stuff growing out of it. There, there's, it's, it doesn't look like it's in like the worst shape ever. You can still walk across it. I'm sure it could probably even support the weight of a car, but it's shut down completely. So they've just taken the stretch of road that's maybe a quarter mile section and just completely shut it off and haven't touched it at all. But they've paved on both sides. It's the weirdest thing. I think they were planning on going back and fixing the bridge. I'm not sure. But it worked out in my favor because <laughs> I was able to get some cool pictures. And I even recorded a short for YouTube uh, letting letting people know, like, hey, look, look at this bridge on. It's kind of creepy. Which let me know if you want to hear more about it. And I had people like, yeah, I want to hear about that. So, of course, I had to write a story. And with the pictures that I had, it worked out perfect because I love to use my own pictures when, when possible. That's getting a little bit harder <laughs> as I go forward. But I, I love to use my own pictures for my stories. So I took the picture, and the, the bridge is called the Florence Bridge. I want to say it was near Florence, Ohio. That just comes to me because of the name of the bridge, but I don't honestly know, and I haven't looked at the map. And really, I don't feel like looking at a map right now. <laughs> but it's the Florence Bridge. So, of course, that fit perfect for the name of the story. And what I wanted to do with it was have elements of a curse of some kind because I love a good curse story. Just as much as I love a good ghost story or any other supernatural element, having a solid curse in a story makes it more fun. So I wanted to do something where I could have a curse in the story and I wanted to do something with founding families and that kind of stuff. So I built that into the story and I feel like I did a pretty good job. I liked it when it came out. Um, but <laughs> as always, we'll play the story and then we'll talk about the ending. So here is the Florence Bridge. Decrepit, run down, eyesore. These words were often used to describe the old bridge that sat just outside of town. It had once been the main avenue in and out of the area, but when the highway went through, it was used less and less. By the 1990s, it was declared unsafe by the powers that be and sentenced to be demolished. Years would pass and the bridge would continue to survive. Every time its destruction came up, the money wasn't in the budget. Some groups even fought to save the bridge, claiming historical significance. These claims were laughed off by reasonable people who hadn't spent their teen years chasing ghost stories. Oh yes, there was a ghost story tied to the old structure. Not many believed it, and even fewer knew the full legend by heart. Those whose family roots went back to the founding of the town were the keepers of the tale, but that number dwindled each year as people left or died. By 2017, there were very few left who knew the truth. So that's when our story takes place. 
the last year anyone would associate the bridge with anything other than death. It isn't rust, after all, that stains the concrete deck that used to carry cars over the raging river below. What happened on the night of October 13, 2017, wouldn't be forgotten as quickly as it was buried. Peter, Stacy, and Sabrina had known each other all of their lives. They had grown up in Florence, and their families were all well known with throughout the community. Peter, the former star quarterback, and Stacy had been dating on and off since their sophomore year. Sabrina and Stacy might as well have been sisters, born in the same hospital, a day apart, and living next door to each other ever since. They shared everything from clothes to secrets, and one was rarely seen without the other. After graduation, they all had plans to move away from the small town. Sabrina just needed to save up a little more using tips from her waitressing job. Peter needed a few more months to help his mom get things situated at home, and Stacy couldn't bear the thought of leaving her cat behind. After 10 years, it was safe to say they weren't going anywhere, which was just how Florence wanted things to go. As October of 2017 began, the town was preparing to celebrate its 150th birthday. Banners were hung and a whole week of festivities was planned leading up to the big day. Fall was always a popular time around the community, and anniversary years were all the more special. Every 25 years, they would have a big party with singing and dancing going on into the wee hours of the morning. The mayor would make a speech recalling the prior quarter of a century. The sheriff would chase off drunk teens trying to hook up in the dark corners. And a pig would be offered to the town spirits to secure another 25 years of prosperity. On October 11th, Stacy called Sabrina and asked her if she would be willing to go for a drive. Sabrina agreed and the two women soon found themselves cruising down a back road under a nearly full moon. They mostly discussed work and what they had been up to lately, but Sabrina could tell Stacy had more on her mind. Pulling the car into a parking area on the outskirts of town, Sabrina turned to her friend. Alright girl, something's up. I don't know what it is, but you need to spill it, she said, glaring. I honestly don't know if it's even anything to worry about. Peter's been kind of distant lately, and he won't talk to me. Part of me feels like something's up. Stacy put her head in her hands as she spoke, hiding the tears as they started flowing. I know you guys have been through a lot, but I don't think you'd know what to do without each other. How many times have you both said you were done? And that never lasts more than a week. What's any different now? Maybe it's just because hormones bouncing around, but I think he's cheating. Stacy glanced up. Cheating? With who? And what do you mean, hormones? I'm pregnant. I haven't told anyone yet. I just found out myself last week. Stacy started sobbing harder, and Sabrina struggled to find the right words. Pregnant? That's great news, isn't it? Why haven't you told Peter? I tried, but every time I started the conversation, he says he has to make a call or go somewhere. I've only seen him a couple of times in the last week. Stacy was starting to calm down again. Look, I'm sure he's just busy with work. Maybe just break the news in a text message. That would certainly get his attention. Sabrina smiled. After a little more back and forth, the women made their way back to town with Sabrina dropping Stacy off and promising to call the next day. Stacy had actually been able to laugh at the list of ways Sabrina thought would be the best way to tell Peter about the baby, and she said that she'd consider some of them if push came to shove. But Peter would never find out about the baby. On the morning of October 12th, Stacy woke to find that Peter hadn't come home the night before. Calls to his phone went unanswered, and no one in the family seemed to know where he had gone. Calling Sabrina, 
seemed to be just as fruitless at first, though she finally picked up, sounding like she was a bit hungover. Hey girl, what you calling this early for? You talked to Peter yet? Sabrina slurred. Peter's missing. I can't get a hold of him and no one else knows where he is. Oh shit, give me a few to get a shower and I'll be over. Sabrina said before hanging up. An hour later, the two were circling the town in Sabrina's car, searching for Peter or any information they could get. By mid-afternoon, they were among the crowds downtown, asking everyone in town when they had last seen him. The day ended with no new leads, though no one else seemed to be as worried as Stacy. Even Sabrina was starting to say that he would probably just turn up at some point. Stacy didn't sleep that night. She tried to rest, but every time she started to doze off, she was awoken by images of Peter on a bridge screaming for help. She tried to ignore them, but the visions kept getting stronger and she started to feel like she recognized the bridge. As dawn broke, she called Sabrina to come over once more, telling her about the dreams and begging her to help. Sabrina arrived with a small box of tea and got to work brewing up a drink to help Stacy calm her nerves. It was only a dream, she said. Nothing to worry about. After a few sips of tea, Stacy began to relax. It really was helping. Her eyes closed for a second and she found herself in a peaceful meadow, surrounded by flowers and the sound of birds singing. Maybe Peter really was okay and she was just overreacting to the whole situation. The drip of something cold and wet on her nose snapped her back to reality. It was dark and she was outside, laying on concrete and looking up at the stars. The full moon cast just enough light to see that something was hanging above her, dangling from some kind of beam. She tried to move, but her body wouldn't obey her wishes. She could move her eyes around enough to make out the structure of what looked like a bridge. She recognized this place. She was on the old decrepit bridge that was supposed to have been torn down years prior. But how? I wondered how long you'd be out. I was hoping to have one more chat before the ceremony. Sabrina's voice echoed all around. Still unable to move, Stacy looked up again toward the sky trying to make out what was hanging above her. Another drip landed on her face, this one hitting her top lip. The taste of iron hinting at what the liquid was. Don't worry, you'll be joining him soon. Oh, I meant to tell you I found Peter. It helped that I was the one who made him go missing in the first place. You were right, you see. He was cheating on you. He was going to leave you for good but that wasn't necessary. She walked onto the bridge, finally showing up in Stacy's field of view. Whatever had paralyzed her was starting to wear off, and Stacy found she could now turn her head ever so slightly. Gazing at Sabrina, Stacy was able to just barely speak, using all of her strength. Why? Uh, what are you doing? She groaned. Well, you know that story our parents told us when we were kids? Uh, about this bridge and how our ancestors wiped out all those natives who were trying to steal our land? Turns out it was all true. But there was a curse laid on our families. Basically, we can't leave until the last descendant of the last family has a baby. It's a whole thing, and I don't want to bore you with the details, but you aren't the only one who's pregnant. I know it's a lot to take in, but I really want to get out of this town, and this is the only way. But I've got to do it right at 10 p.m. for some reason. Curses never really make that much sense, but I'm not going to argue with a century-old book. She was looking down over the edge of the bridge now, her voice sounding more jagged as she spoke. Stacy was still not able to move more than her head, and she was beginning to feel sleep trying to take over again. Sabrina had to be out of her mind. None of them had ever taken the old story seriously. Even their parents had only shared the tale as a ghost story around the campfire, 
No one actually believed it, though. As she struggled to fully realize what was happening, she saw Sabrina glance down at her phone before grabbing the handle of something sitting next to her and walking over. Despite what I have to do, just know that I still love you and I really wish there was another way, Sabrina said, lifting the axe above her head. Closing her eyes, Stacy mentally braced for the pain that was about to come, wishing she could scream out or move. But instead of an axe striking its target, the sound of a gun firing filled the air. Three more shots rang out, followed by a loud thud. Then, Stacy passed out again. The next time she woke, she was greeted by bright lights and the sound of beeping. She opened her eyes to find herself in a hospital bed, her parents sitting next to her. The feeling in her body had returned, and she was able to move her hand enough to touch her mother's hand as it rested on the bed. A flurry of activity followed, with doctors and nurses coming in to ask how she was doing and a feeding tube being removed from her mouth. In the coming days, a detective would come by to get her statement and help her better understand what she had been through. Sabrina had been shot and killed on the bridge just seconds before she could kill Stacy. Peter had been sleeping with both women, and both had become pregnant around the same time. It all seemed so surreal. Her parents confirmed the part of the legend that Sabrina had been talking about, emphasizing that it was only a legend. The baby, it turned out, was unharmed through the whole ordeal, and a few months later, Stacy found herself back in the hospital with a baby girl in her arms. The feeling of being a mother was overwhelming, but there was another feeling that crept up as well. For the first time in her life, Stacy felt like a weight had been lifted off of her. She felt like she could go anywhere she wanted. She'd never been outside of Florence, but that was about to change. A few weeks later, she sat on a bus with her baby in her arms as they crossed the county line together. In the distance, she could see the outline of a decrepit, run-down, a sore of a bridge with a dark stain that should never be mistaken for rust. Okay, so like I said there, <laughs> the curse, founding families, the works. I wanted to have some fun with it, and I wanted to poke fun at curses too. Because if you if you listen, there's a, there's a line in there... Uh, along the line, something along the line of uh, well, curses don't make sense because you know I have to kill you at 10 p.m. exactly. Uh, I'm not going to argue with an old book, you know, and <laughs> that I wanted to include that specifically because there's so many stories, so many movies, books like that involve curses, and the curses will have like just these weird ass guidelines that don't make any sense. Um, a lot of time with curses. And it's not just curses either. You know, it's, 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 if you look at the, the 3 a.m. challenges are a famous one that kind of fall hand in hand with curses where they all have like this, this aspect of like a timing or a time of year or d different things like that. And, and realistically, it only makes sense on the local time scale, you know, because even if, let's say that you have to do a particular ritual to lift a curse and that ritual has to be done. Uh, under the full moon in the fall. Well, fall in the northern hemisphere is different than fall in the southern hemisphere because the tilt of the earth. So in Australia, it might be fall, whereas in Ohio, it's the middle of the summer. Even if you go by, by months, okay, well, it depends on when, when the curse was put in place because the calendars have changed and different, you know, different places use different calendars. Like, there's all of these different things that, that just, it, it's it's crazy the way that, the, the way that we would think that these would work. And so I wanted to kind of call that out <laughs> while still having a curse that would make some sense. And, you know, the, the idea of like Peter sleeping with both girls, they both got pregnant. Uh, Sabrina, she, she bought into the curse hardcore. She wanted to get out of town and she thought the only way to do that was to kill off Peter, he she didn't care about Peter, but specifically to kill off Stacy, because it had to be the last descendant 
of the last family to give birth. And in that case, she wanted it to be her. She would be the last descendant of the last family because there was no other founding family still around. But as it worked out, she wasn't that. <laughs> so I was having some fun with it. And, and I feel like there's probably a loophole in there somewhere. If you if you <laughs> if you hear a loophole, or you see a loophole, let me know. You know, if you're if you're watching this on YouTube, you can comment down below. If you're not watching this on YouTube, uh, you could rate the podcast and just in your rating, leave me something. <laughs> right about how, hey, there was a problem with your curse, but I still love the podcast, you know. Five star ratings across the board. That's the goal. But <laughs> getting back on track. So that was where I wanted to go with that one to have some fun with with the curse idea and do something original because I haven't done a lot of curse stories and I want to do some more of those as I go forward. I don't know exactly what I want to do with them yet, but I, I love doing the supernatural death, ghost, supernatural stuff in, sto in stories because it really connects with people. You know, it's, it's the stuff that people, people really love those kind of stories. I love those kind of stories as much as I love realistic kind of stories or more grounded in reality type of th stuff. I really love the supernatural element. And so I'm going to keep writing those kind of things. But I think <laughs> we're coming close to the end now. And I I just want to thank everybody that's been out there that's been supporting me. Whether you're on YouTube, these podcasts, I've had people downloading the podcast. And, and I don't get a chance on, through the podcast platforms, I don't get a chance to see the same way I do on YouTube. You know, people can comment on YouTube and they can, if they have public subscriptions, you can see when they subscribe, that kind of stuff. But on the podcast platform, I don't get that same thing. And so it's it's kind of a big mystery box to me when I see like, oh, I had 30 downloads on this podcast episode and I have no idea. I, 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 I assume people are listening. <laughs> and I appreciate every single one of you because it's it's amazing to me the idea that I could rec I could put something together like this and put it out there in such a way that uh, potentially thousands of people strangers could could hear it it's it's such a weird feeling uh different from youtube and that's <laughs> I, without going too far off on the tangent here it's a completely different feeling so i want to thank you if you have made it this far i've got uh, i've got a patreon if you're interested if if that's something that you're into and you like to support or you're looking for ways to support or whatever there, there's there's stuff that i have over there it's not just a platform for donations for support. Actually, I've got, I, I, I give away postcards every month. I've got, uh, the th I've got a three dollar tier is my basic tier, and I've got everybody on the three dollar tier gets a postcard, a custom postcard every month. I take my own pictures, make them into postcards, and mail them out to people. I also give everybody access to read these stories that I write, because I know some people prefer the written versions. So I want people to be able to read the versions and that kind of stuff. And I'm going to be doing some other behind the scenes things and probably some other different um, Patreon only podcasts or I'm not sure yet what I want to do because I don't have subscriptions yet on here. I might uh, have some kind of subscriber tier. I don't know yet. This is all brand new to me. I'm still figuring this out. This is only episode five. I've only been doing podcasting for two months now. So just bear with me and uh, let's have some fun as we go along. But that's all I got for now. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. I want to thank you all for watching or listening. <laughs> Either way, I'm still getting out of the YouTube. But uh, thank you all for listening. Everybody have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.